Thank you guys, especially Piobs, Lavender, and Alan. TFT has never shied away from controversy, from match fixing in competitive to some wonky ass patches. But there was one time when this got dialed up to 11, and that was the entirety of set 9. For years, players have debated the eternal question, should you be able to force comps, or is TFT supposed to be all about flexibility? Well, set 9 didn't just answer that, it force fed us with some of the most forcible metas of all time. And those metas can be broken down into a few main eras, Twisted Fate meta, Draven meta, and Earth meta, each one bringing a whole new level of batshit insanity to the game. There were some other ones that were kinda strong or pretty strong, but these ones were probably the worst defenders. Isn't it fitting that TFT's wildest set would happen in essentially what's a revival of set 1? Because if set 1 taught us anything, it's that Rune Terror is really just just a beautiful broken mess, as nature intended. But before we dive into the madness, let's talk about what Set 9 actually did pretty well. Set 9 was a playground for those who dared defy the meta. Between T-Hex and Zorn, the set offered an insane number of ways to play. It introduced us to Kale, a one cost unit who scaled into a god at level 9, even as a 2 star, and we also saw some wild strategies like double up Talia emerge. The portal mechanic was a much better version of Set 3's galaxies, giving the players the ability to choose what portal they wanted, and it's no surprise now that it's an evergreen feature. It's that little sliver of agency that people like, that feel that they have some control. But in Set 9, not all portals were created equally, and some had some pretty wonky playstyles. Then there were five cost units like Rise, Heimer, and Scion, which gave us some pretty interesting interactions, but that will come a bit later. What I'm trying to say is that in a vacuum without legends, set 9 might actually be one of the greatest sets we've ever had, and it might be a controversial take. And with legends, it pushed the boundaries of what TFT could achieve, and I'm going to show you why. So where do I begin? Well, how about with legends? You chose one before you went into game that matched your playstyle, and then they gave you augments tailored to their specific fantasy. So with Ezreal you got items, with Aurelian Soul you got experience, with Tom Kent you got gold. Were Legends a mistake? Probably. At least from a balancing perspective. And bringing in portals and legends at the same time? Well, that was no small amount of hubris on Riot's part. But why? Why are legends so terrible? On paper it sounds great, right? You can pick a legend that matches your playstyle and play the way you want. For a casual player, that's pretty cool. But if that's the case, why did the casual players hate it just as much as the competitive scene? Well, it's because legends like Twisted Fate created one of the worst initial metas in all of TFT. For a man all about gambling, Twisted Fate said, hmm, fuck fate and loaded his deck with two things, Zeke's Herald and a couple Rage Blades. Before Twisted Fate, Zeke's Herald had been in a great spot. For years it had been a reliable support item, like Zephyr, something you'd grab off Final Carousel to give your comp a little extra oomph, but suddenly with units like Garen and Aphelios who scale massively with attack speed, Zeke's became a god tier item. Now instead of getting one Zeke's to buff your Aphelios, you could stack six Zeke's and have best in slot in your carry, turning units like Garen into a lawnmower of doom. Funnily enough, set 9 and set 1 both had their own lawnmower comps, which is kind of interesting. But when we talk about this forcibility, we often focus on the negatives, the sharp edge of the sword that faces towards us. But what about the good bits? Well, set 9 was also the time when the players like Leduc became incredibly popular, creating some of the most mind-boggling builds in TFT history, from Zephyr stacking blue buff Cassante to instantly kick away the backline, to Zorn Jarvan but more about Zorn Jarvan later. Twisted Fate might have given us a terrible meta, but it also opened the door to chase wild and interesting ideas that didn't necessarily require a high roll, and that's a good thing. It's just a shame that it came with the terrible consequences that it did. So, once Riot nerfed Twisted Fate into the ground, where did the hard forces turn to to get their fix? Enter Draven. Like the megalomaniac he is, he took center stage, whether you liked it or not. Now in my opinion, this could have been even worse than Twisted Fate. Not because Draven was a better strategy, far from it. While Twisted Fate was forcible, Draven was all about RNG. When one player is playing Draven, it's no big deal, they can get lucky or they can fail. It becomes a problem when 8 people are playing Draven, which happened a lot. Suddenly there was always that one person who was guaranteed a bit of Mort Dog's good graces and got a really good comp at 2-1 and could just play with infinite resources. So why was it so strong? Well, with a solid early game, you could snowball into an insanely capped board and play for a 3 star 4 or 5 cost, as spoils of war would drop you infinite goodies, ranging from duplicators to items to gold, but don't take my word for it, here's popular streamer K3 Shoju explaining why it was so bad. GG. Like, it, it, the game is, it, we're not even playing TFT. Like, we're actually not even playing TFT. It's literally just, who can 
fucking high roll on 2-1 and 2-2 and just snowball the game out of fucking control. Like, it's... Uh, what the fuck is this? Like, it, please. There's no fucking way this is not hotfix. Like, there's just no way. No, it's fun, but like, bro, like, you can't play this for two weeks straight. You are just playing the game with infinite resources. On 2-1, let's say you farm three gold. You don't think three gold is a lot, but that three gold is, is enough to level you to level five. Maybe you can hold an extra pair on bench. And then now you're level five and you would have lost your streak, which is another two gold, by the way, because you get one gold for winning, one gold for streak. And now you're level five. And now you're level five. And now if you win that fight because you're level five, you kill an extra two units. And maybe those two drops give you five gold. And now what should look at that. Now you're level six. And you can just hold everything. And how do you know on level 5 and level 6 you don't see a 4 cost that helps you streak even more? And then it just snowballs and snowballs and snowballs. And then that's why there's a guy that's level 9, 30 gold on 4-2 with a rise. And he just wins the game instantly. And what was the issue? Well, if you weren't playing Draven, you were basically doing your best 2018 Tyler 1 cosplay, throwing the game on purpose. And that's not fun, even for casual players. Sure, there are some honorable mentions like On, Ezreal, and kind of Yi at some points, but they didn't have the same level of infamy. Ornn was great for playing flexibly and giving your carry a strong artifact, because at that point, the artifacts were insanely strong, and his prismatic and silver versions were just so powerful compared to the rest of the augments you could pick, that he always had his place in the meta, but he was always overshadowed when the other legends were so much more powerful. Ezreal was strong too, his golden prismatic versions almost guaranteed you two units with three items, which a lot of comps couldn't handle, and there were times when everyone was playing Ezreal, but again, when the other legends were really strong, Ezreal kind of failed faded away, he wasn't really that good. And Yi, he was a go-to for combat augments and his first augment pumping up was crazy for certain comps. There were the really poor performing ones like Vagar and Bards, which almost always were never picked by anyone outside of a normal game. I mean, people tried in the beginning, but they were, they were awful. And what about Earth? Well, Earth was absolutely disgusting because of Void, Demacia, and other vertical traits. It wasn't uncommon to see three or four people playing Void at certain times in the meta, particularly in Ionia portals, where you could almost guarantee eight Void. And in some lobbies, Barons were everywhere. Not to mention the Ionia spat fit into many different comps because it was just so overtuned at that time. If you think true damage Caitlyn in set 10 was bad, Ionia was probably up there too. But it was more the fact that verticals were so strong in set 9 and set 9 had one of the worst vertical metas of all time in every set because you could guarantee a vertical prismatic very very comfortably. What about my personal favorites? And they were the Dragon King and the River King legends. Sure they were were the epitome of first or eight, but they hold a special place in my heart. If only for the infamous line, it's okay if you lose to Krugs by one. Their augments were so good. Dragon King basically meant you could get to level nine, level 10 by four, two. And the same with the River King as well. Oh, and by the way, the, the names were, uh, actually Aurelian Assault and Time Kench, but they had, they had different names. You could just play for an insanely capped board because you literally had almost a hundred gold in value from the augment. And then there were portals. And I'm not gonna cover every portal. Some are still with us today, while others, well, they were a bit broken. Most people gravitated towards Ionia for a lot of the set because if you got the right Ionia portal, you basically played for a vertical trait, like eight Baron, and then you just won the game. But there were some interesting choices like Demacia having a king that if you died, you lost the fight. And of course, no Nobody's favorite, Stillwater, which I'm pretty sure Riot only put in there just to see if that people really like augments. And given the option, they will not play without augments ever. But don't go anywhere just yet. This is just the tip of the iceberg. It wasn't just the portals and the legends that were insane. The traits in the units were absolutely mind blowing too. Remember T Hex, that single trait that embodied one of the coolest fantasies in the entirety of like TFT in general? And don't get me started on Zorn, trust me, it gets pretty wild. We've seen traits like Peeltover and T Hex before in Fortune and Mercenaries, but this one had a distinct difference, at least initially, and that was that you didn't actually need to cash out. Instead, you could play this insane dinosaur beast that could win you the game by itself, which is a f***ing cool concept, even if not everyone enjoyed it. But I'm pretty sure if those people actually had the dragon, they would be enjoying themselves. It was only when other people did it that they got upset with the whole idea. And that's the crux of TFT in general is, I like it when I have it, but I don't like it when you have it. But who cares about that? But what made this set feel so amazing was it was literally the League of Legends set. Rune Terra's finest coming into battle. It really felt like you were playing League of Legends as a TFT one more time since the days of set one. And that's cool. 
Take Noxus, for example, the trait that gave you extra stats by killing other units, which is incredibly Noxon. They're all about conquering other people and taking their land. You kill the other units and you take the stats. And it had some of the most infamous reroll comps of all time, from Samira to Katarina. You were never short of options. Plus, Scion was one of the best five cots in the set. He was finding his way into every single comp or board eventually, thanks to his double HP mechanic and his ability to splash Bruiser. And Samira single-handedly changed how Riot addressed armor and MR, because there were times when she could literally take her champion to negative armor, and she was one of the most dominant rerolls of the set. And you also could play with Katarina. Then there was Ionia, the trait that turned your units into buffed up nightmares with the Ionia spatula being one of the most disgusting spatulas of the set as I already mentioned. Put it on Aphelios and just win I guess. And then you had reroll Z, also using Katarina by the way. And let's not forget Ari, an incredible 5 cost that didn't break the meta at all. Nope, not at all. Shurima was also there, that trait that ascended your units into literal gods. Could it be any more Shurima than that? Well this one had the action reroll comp, which when you combine with Freljord and the Sun, Sandra had its moments where it completely took over, and I'll admit, it almost made me quit the set. Shurima was probably one of the strongest traits of the set, between Cassante, Azir, and Nasus, not to mention Double Trouble to Leo. These units were like sand, they were rough, they were coarse, and they got everywhere. And speaking of Freljord, well, that was one of the traits that worked with pretty much everything. You know, we have a couple of these traits like Dragon Lords and Set Term, but you could play with anything which is like Zeru, Shurima, or whatever. It was a trait so versatile because of its utility, giving you Shred, Mana Reeve, and even a stun, you always tried to get it in if you could. And also the units like Lissandra, Sejuani, and Ash. And Ash had a surprisingly strong reroll comp at one point in time, but these units were just baseline amazing to get in. Demacia gave you radiant items and extra stats, which is very Demacian. And it had Garen, as I mentioned before, with his horrible Rageblade build. There was also Lux and Jarvan, and Jarvan was a true star of TFT, but I'll cover his best time shortly. But in Demacia, he served as the chief frontline unit. Multicast the Sona was another comp of set 9 that had people scratching their heads. And of course, Kale, if you hit her 3 star and at level 9, you're basically playing with the 3 star forecast. But Demacia's real strength came in with Earth, and getting plus one to Demacia was basically a guaranteed first thanks to how strong the prismatic version was, giving you five radiant items and completely infinite stats. My personal favourite though was Shadow Isles, and you played around Senna and Gwen, and I loved this comp so much. All it did was, after a few times that you attacked, you got a shield, and you generated mana every second over the course of the round. There was a special Maokai and Viego reroll build, but really, units like Senna always found her way into many comps because of just how absolutely game-breaking her ability was, and also Gwen fit into Slayer comps and she would just dash around the board and kill everything. Granted, there were times when her ability was not quite went up to par, but I still liked playing her because I thought she was cool. Targon was a simple trait, and it had Aphidios, who was the main recipient of the Twisted Fate meta, but Tarek was extremely flexible, being a soak for all damage, and Soraka giving healing, giving us another iteration of tank, or in this case Bastion trait, plus Mystic trait. There's always been a feature of every set in TFT, plus Soraka was an invoker, so you know what that means. You play invoker, plus Ari, get your Tarek in, and you just win. And then there was Void, the trait that brought Baron Nasha to the Convergence. Now that is kind of cool when you think about it. Like being able to spawn the biggest Baron ever and watch it jump onto your board and annihilate your enemies. But the units themselves were middling at best. Belveth had her moments where she would either grief you or smurf you and Kaisa was your go-to carry. But if you did get a voice spatula, you just toss in a Yasuo and you basically just win the game for free because Kaisa and Yasuo together were just insanely strong. And everyone's favourite, of course it's always their favourite because it's always a favourite in every single set that there is, is Yordles. And it was a bit like set 4 Moonlight, where you would get a couple units star up and become a 4 star. And it's a shame there's no Yordle Lord from set 6 this time because that would have been cool. Imagine a 4 star Vega. But still, the Yordle was THE reroll comp and if you ever hit the Heimer 3, let's just say there was no unit on Earth that could beat that. And of course there was Zorn, with Zeri and Jinx, but also Urgot with his shotgun knees. Echo featured in a ton of reroll comps as well, and was completely disgusting. And of course Warwick had one of the best hero augments of the set. But it wasn't just the units that were broken, it was the Zorn items themselves. Virulent and Bioware, well, play Zero and win. In fact, Virulent and Zeri was one of the hardest hitting combos of set 9. Exoskeleton, well that had a broken interaction with Sion, where he would just charge into the backline and die and blow up the entire enemy team. But my favourite way to play Zorn? Unstable Chemtech Jarvan 
before. Jumping into the enemy team and blowing it up. You cannot describe the joy this trade gave me. And don't get me wrong, the other items were cool too. They were just not as iconic. iconic. I mean, Robotic Iron was good with Warwick because you could hit some nutty numbers with Rage Blades. And then there were the other ones as well. But again, I don't want to cover it all. Otherwise, this video would be like literally like 30 minutes long. But if I did miss anything, please let me know in the comments. But where would this set be without Vertical Bruisers? You get a three-star Rek'Sai and you're chilling. She provided infinite true damage. And then you also had Cho on the side generating stacks. If you hit him three-star, it almost felt practically unbeatable because you had so much health, so much damage, and Cho'Gath would just scale infinitely into the late game. You could also play challengers with Yasuo, who felt really close to his League of Legends lore. And then you also had Kaiser and Samira. It felt amazing to play. And of course, there was still the reroll Warwick build that popped up here and there. And it was kind of a different take from most other attack speed based comps that relied on one cost reroll or two cost reroll. This time it was four cost, so you could actually play at fast eight, which is not normally how we play challengers. Another cool one was Deadeye, and that was a spin on Snipers, and it had a lot of versatility. Of course, the best users were Aphelios Action on Ergo, and maybe some random reroll Ash build that popped up here and there. There were so many units you could splash as a frontline. Deadline itself never felt itself to be dead. Gunner was cool with Jay, Senna, and of course, Zeri and Jinx. Jinx being a premier reroll of the set that completely dominated the meta. And also, if you got the virulent Bioware and Zeri, you kind of just won the game. It had an insane cap, and you could flex pretty much any frontline. It was an amazing, amazing comp. You had Slayer that featured Zed, Atrox, and Gwen, who completely dominated the meta at so many points in the game. I mean, Gwen really needed to be slightly more buffed with her targeting and everything. And even now in set 12, we still had the same problems. But Zed himself was one of the best reroll comps of the entire set. Trying to emulate his days in set 4 as Spirit Zed or 4.5 as Slayer Zed, it's just like, oh my god, he just cannot be put down in that form. And Riot in set 9 had one of the first attempts at an assassin based trait without actually the assassin bit. Assassins, historically, had always dashed to the backline, but this time they decided to do something different. Units themselves will get an edge of night effect and when that procs they'll dash to the backline. But between Zed, Echo, Katarina, there were just so many reroll builds that just popped up, you just couldn't handle them all. And it was actually incredibly bugged at the start of the set because sometimes if their units cast, they wouldn't actually dash to the back line. But that didn't stop them from being disgustingly broken. We had a couple of the best augment interactions in TFT history. One of them was Talia, which was double trouble Talia or whatever it is, which anytime a unit was knocked up, she could fire a rock set. This meant that you just put the units in the work with Talia, which was mostly just two sets and two Talias, and then you put Swain and Teemo in for some multicaster and strategist action, and that was it. That was your level eight board. It was really easy to play, and it was just an impossible comp to deal with because it just had so much upfront damage, and, it, and for certain points in the set, it was an auto win. But traits were one thing. There were the units themselves that were kind of interesting. Heimer at four star had a cool little Easter egg, and Heimerdinger, he worked a lot like set three mercenary, but he got his own turret, and you could choose basically these abilities to buff the turret, which ranged from shrink ray, extra gold, Gold or a self repair, so it would repair itself while Heimerdinger was still alive. But let's be real, everyone only ever took the gold. Now is it? Oh, and maybe sometimes the self repair part as well. Sion was awesome as before, and Cassante was a lot of people's favorite champs to play around, but also a lot of people's most hated champ in the game, because of course, people hate one-hit kill abilities. Now, Atrox is cool in concept, because when he died, he would jump into other units, making them stronger, exactly like how a Darkin Blade works in the lore. The shining example of this set is Ryze who changed based on the portal. Now for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to list all 10 of Ryze's interactions because people will hate that and get very bored, but they range from throwing items at enemies to spawning a sand tornado that generated items to increased damage based on gold generated. Either way, it was an amazing take on Ryze and his lore in the Runeterra universe. Kind of felt like his ability was him roaming around the different regions of Runeterra and casting abilities. It's kind of cool. But seriously, if I missed anything, or if you have any strong opinions about a unit on Legend, please let me know in the comments. And I mean, if we hit at least 10 likes, I'll make a video on set 8. Isn't it amazing how set 9 had it all? From broken augments, overpowered units, to wild mechanics, it was a playground for off-meta champions to truly shine and flex their creativity. Yes, there was a defined meta, but people didn't necessarily have to play like that. You can still play the way that you wanted to, and Legends did facilitate that fact. 
I look back on this set with fondness because it was such an incredible experience. Revisiting Runeterra with all my favourite champions and the only thing it missed, like the only thing, was build water. And as a result of set 9's chaos, items like Zeke's Chalice and Locket were removed from the regular item pool and moved to a support item and this hid them behind a small RNG wall. Did that stop Twisted Fate from being broken? Fuck no. We often look back and in a vacuum we sit there and think about the metas. The meta, the meta, the meta. This is all we go on about in our whole world. It's just the meta. When you have like a set like nine, it's not about the meta. It doesn't have to be about the meta. We don't need to tunnel on. We had an opportunity to explore and experiment and do crazy things that we wouldn't normally be able to do outside of an insane high roll. Set nine gave us a glimpse of what that world could look like. And unfortunately, because it's exploitable, it leads to problems. Seriously though, it's not so much that legends were a problem necessarily, I think that's a little bit disingenuous. The problem is third party apps, and you're gonna be like, oh, third party apps aren't a problem, but they kind of are in some circumstances. Because for instance, when you go into a game and you know that Avaris has like a 4.2 average over something like Callista, which might have a 4.5 average, not that big of a deal. You can play either one and that's fine. The problem is, is with things like legends, which you pick before you go into the game, if you see that one legend has a much lower average than the other, you're always going to pick it, no matter what. And that was the problem with legends. It wasn't so much that they were necessarily incorrect or wrong or flawed in any way. It's just that people will always pick what's strongest because it's something you can opt in beforehand and people will always opt in to what is stronger. I would love to see Legends come back as something, maybe a normal, so that way I can go and do crazy things like Triple Rage Blade or Infinite Redemption comps. Set 9 really gave us a look of what TFT could be with no boundaries, no limits, when everything is forcible and you could do some crazy things. It was like playing TFT on sandbox mode. This is all because Legends allowed it to be. Were Legends a mistake? Well, that's for you to decide.